Hello and welcome to Rock Your Block. In today's segment of Late to Rest, Live Well and End Well, I'm your host, Ruth Pegaron. I'm the founder and owner of Late to Rest Services. And today will be the first of a series of interviews with professionals that serve in the end of life or funeral industry. They serve when selling products or with services that help people as they transition in life to their latter days. We will focus on living well and ending life well. I'm excited to start the series with our special guest today, who is, chaplain, who is a chaplain. Our guest compassionately ministers to sick, hurt, and those experiencing grief. She currently serves as a VITAS hospice chaplain. Additionally, she is currently serving as an associate pastor and the director of education at her local church, One World Community Church. She's a certified pastoral care specialist with a BS in communications and a master's in human services as well as counseling. She hosts a monthly bereavement group where she is passionate to help others in their journey of grief. Our guest is a native of, of Texas, so she's a Texan, and that is where she met and married the love of her life, retired Colonel Lacey Ingram Jr., United States Air Force, and he is the executive pastor of One World Community Church. They have two sons, Lacey Ingram III and Lance Ingram, both of whom, whom resides overseas. Our guest is a fervent teacher of God's word and ministers both her favorite scripture, which is 2 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Please welcome our special guest today, Chaplain Mildred S. Ingram, to our segment, Lay to Rest, Live Well, End Well. Welcome, Chaplain Mildred. Thank you, Ruth, yes. and thank you so much for inviting me on. You're welcome. Today, I know you're doing exciting things, yes. and I'm just happy to be part of it and um, partner with you. Well, thank you so much. Your work and my work, I know they're similar, mm -hmm. um, where it's end of life, but mine's is on the other end. Yours is really comforting them up to that, and so I am just inspired by what you do. And all the chaplains and what they do. I think it's just an honorable profession to, to do. So I can't wait to hear more about, you know, why you chose this profession, how you ended up in this profession, um, just more of your story, um, just so others know. I mean, I'm sure there will be some of our viewers that wonder, how can I do that? Mm -hmm. You know, that a lot of people have compassionate hearts. A lot of people want to serve people. There's something called a deaf doula I'm often asked about. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you're very close to that in a lot of ways. So why don't we start with that? Why don't you just tell us your story, how you became a chaplain? Okay, my story. Your story. I think it chose me. Okay. Um, and my story begins with my family. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a mother in hospice, two brothers, a brother-in-law, sister-in-law, mm -hmm. and a mother-in-law. But it's really, my first encounter was with my mother. She was in a nursing home at the time and she suffered a hematoma, um, a small blood vessel in her brain mm -hmm. uh, due to a fall. And they had to do an operation which resulted in her falling into a coma and things went downhill from there. Mm -hmm. She, uh, they called all of the family together and they told us about hospice, that she was going to be put on hospice care, and they was not expecting her to live. That's when I met the most compassionate, caring mm -hmm. people, Ruth. 
I didn't know anything about a hospice, mm -hmm. and they told me that they would make her comfortable till death occurred. So after that, um, I was so gracious mm -hmm. of the care and the consideration and the compassion that was shown to me and my family. I really wanted to give back. Wow. So I started volunteering, not with the company, the hospice uh, organization I'm with now, but with another um, organization. Mm -hmm. And I took their volunteer courses, and I was a companion um, volunteer where I would allow the spouse or the primary caregiver to go off for a couple of hours and I would just sit with their loved one oh. uh, by their bedside. Oh, what a great way to get started. Yeah, so yeah. when um, an opportunity came up that they needed a chaplain, since I was uh, ecclesiastically endorsed mm -hmm. and part of ministry, if they needed a chaplain, they would ask me, could I pray with this person or, you know, offer support? And I was more than happy to. Mm -hmm. Then this organization had a chaplain job to come available. So I applied, made it to the second interview, and then they asked me about CPE, clinical pastoral education. Oh. Hadn't a clue what that was. Okay. And I said, well, I have a master's in human services and counseling, and I've been the bereavement counselor, and mm -hmm. I do this for my, you know, church. Mm -hmm. And they said, no, you need this. I said, well, whatever it takes, I'll do. I only needed one unit. I was so fascinated about CPE, clinical uh -huh. pastoral education. I took four units, oh, all wow. of them. <laughs> and two internships. Oh, yes. So with... This is your uh, calling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So after that, Ruth, what I did was I applied to my present company that I'm working with, uh, Vitas, and um, didn't get the job the first mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. But they offered me a volunteer bereavement uh, group, support group, um, and I took it and worked as a bereavement for about, I guess, six months. Mm -hmm. And then the next time a chaplain position came available, mm -hmm. I was in, and that was three years ago. And that was three years. <laughs> yes. So in total, how long have you been a chaplain? Um, I did volunteer with mm -hmm. um, a local hospital. Okay. So in all, it's been about seven years now. Seven years. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yes. And I'm sure you've touched a lot of families. Um, tell us, do you only serve um, families and patients of one particular faith or, um, and then secondly, are they all in the end stage of dying or some of them, you know, a little bit premature? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm trained across multi, uh, multiple disciplines okay. mm -hmm. and I do not, it's not faith based, okay. it's patients. Patient driven, okay. Mm -hmm. Patient driven, driven. Mm -hmm. and what we do, we I meet people where they are. Okay. So I'm there for them mm -hmm. and their families, whether that's offering emotional support to the family, grief um, resources to the family, and whatever the uh, patient's needs are, mm -hmm. I'm there but I'm not there to proselytize at all. Okay. So it, I, from the spiritual to the non-spiritual, I'm just there for them. Okay, well, well that's a great question um, uh, for us to ask you, is how do you minister um, to non-spiritual or non-religious um, clients or patients that are experiencing death? Like, how do you do that? Um, by presence. Presence. Ah. Presence. Wow. Okay. Yes. See, whether we realize it or not, uh -huh. when I enter the room, God enters the room. His okay. presence is there. I never have to mention the word God to uh -huh. them. Uh -huh. And it's, the, it's patient driven. Uh -huh. So active listening is key. Okay. And permission is key. So everything that I do as a chaplain is by permission. I never take any liberties okay. and walk into a room and say, hi, I'm Chaplain Mildred, I'm here to pray for you. Oh no, 
No. That's, that's not what it's about. It's about being there and listening and taking my cues from them. Um, okay. A lot of times, and another thing, Ruth, mm -hmm. I don't dress in clergy attire. Okay. We just dress like common, everyday attire. Mm -hmm. So to present a non-threatening presence. Okay, and non-spiritual and non-authoritative yes. in that world. Yes. So it's more or less you can connect with them where they are. Yes. Okay. And I have a funny story. Uh -huh. um, when I was a hospital chaplain and I went into the room and the patient was coming out the bathroom and I said, hi, I'm Chaplain Mildred. And before I can get it out, she goes, oh, no, I'm not dying. Am I that bad? <laughs> so I really had to learn quick to say, hi, I'm Chaplain Mildred. I just stopped by to say hello. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> so introduce yourself, but give them the mission. And right very the, quickly. Very quickly. Introduce uh -huh. yourself very quickly. Exactly. Yes. I can relate to that. I understand that. So when they're non-spiritual, um, your role is just to hear what they have to say. Is that what I'm hearing you say? And, or hear what their needs may be. And then you're just there to encourage them and be, have a presence. Right. And let them know you exist. Right. Okay. And if they would like to talk, I'm never pushy. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I'm I just introduce myself and say, I'm just stopping by to say hello and let them take the lead from there. Okay. They either invite me in to, to have a seat or they say, no, thank you. Okay. And when it's religious, how was that experience for someone? It's, it's, it's very similar. Okay. Um, I, I will begin the same way with an introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Chaplain Millie. Um, and just stopping by to say hello and let them drive the conversation. And if there is a stale moment or a little bit of pause, mm -hmm. I ask, how may I serve you today? Mm -hmm. And then they'll, they'll let me know. Okay. So that um, sounds like chaplain kind of starts the, your title. You know, everybody's familiar with that. So it kind of starts the conversation and they know what you do. Uh, right. On, okay. And that's a requirement and that's that a requirement. we have to introduce with our title. Okay. Don't want to be deceiving. Don't want to be deceiving. Right. Right. That's exactly right. So what has been one of your most challenging moments? You shared one of your funny ones, which is thank you. But what has been one of your most challenging moments as a chaplain? The most challenging, I would say, is becoming comfortable with silence. Oh, okay. Because when a person is self-reflecting, mm -hmm. Or, you know, they having that inner thoughts. I need to let them think through what they're thinking through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, you, you want to kind of fill in because I'm the one that's feeling awkward. And I'm the one that want mm -hmm. to break that silence. But that's, that's most challenging. It's just being quiet and let them work through mm -hmm. and self-reflect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you said it earlier, where presence sometimes is important, not mm -hmm. words. So your presence being there and just being silent and when they're available or when they want to say something, you're there when they do that as a, and then you can respond. Right. So that has to be challenging yes. because you have to learn, I would, I would think, because every patient is probably very different in this experience. Do you find that? Yes. Okay. Definitely. Religious or non-religious, it really doesn't matter. No. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. And they're, an ex they're experiencing the same thing, that end of life. And another challenge is I pray that I never mm -hmm. become insensitive or just desensitized. Uh, one of the things that I ask at my interview, mm -hmm. I ask, may I cry with my patients? Now, of course, Ruth, I can't waddle on the floor and sob louder right. than them. But just to know that I can not only sympathize, mm -hmm. but empathize. Empathize, right. So I never want to lose that. That's a prayer mm -hmm. of mine. Mm -hmm. Let me always feel what they're going through, mm -hmm. maybe not to the extent, mm -hmm. Uh, because I have experienced death as well, mm -hmm. and I have been on the other end, uh, you know, experiencing uh, hospice. So I never, ever, ever mm -hmm. want to 
make this routine and mundane or just, you know, this is my job, this is what I do, let's go on, no. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, that is, that's wonderful to hear yeah. because I know that it probably could be that easily for someone mm -hmm. um, in, not, in any profession, mm -hmm. you know, that can be that, especially a service possession that the patient just becomes, okay, the next one, the next one. And um, that's a great prayer mm -hmm. is that you always have the empathy and yes. always have the care and the compassion yes. um, when you show up every day. Okay, mm -hmm. any other challenging moments? Um, uh, being a female. Okay, all right. <laughs> yes. Now why is that? Um, I already mentioned that we don't wear the clergy attire. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And when I introduce myself um, as a chaplain, some people, but you're female, and I uh -huh. said, Yes, thank you for noticing. Yes, you know, yes, yes. Uh, in some uh, religions are more male. Um, they're used to more men. Okay, being, being in your role. Right, mm -hmm. than I am. So getting past that, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I said, let them know that, yes, I am a female chaplain, and how may I serve you? Mm-hmm. Well, good, that's a great response. Mm -hmm. So um, back to the training a little bit. Are you ongoing training just what the expectation is for clergy um, in a hospice like VITAS or you know, or, or in a hospital? You mentioned you worked in a hospital and then of course VITAS. Um, are you trained of just what the, um, someone with, with every faith would be expecting from a clergy so that you can at least relate to what their religion would be? Is that something that's in your training? It is. Okay. Um, in getting my master's, mm -hmm. uh, there was extensive training uh, with different faiths okay. and beliefs mm -hmm. and the non-spiritual as well mm -hmm. um, and what that looked like and how you can actually still serve them. And you notice I said serve and not minister. Mm -hmm. That's right. So that's what we do, we serve. And I also have continuing education classes. Mm -hmm. In order to be a hospice chaplain, you have to hold a Master of Divinity or something similar, um, master's degree. And you also have to take that uh, clinical pastoral education. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's ongoing then? It is ongoing. Okay, so you can always relate to every patient no matter what their faith is, yes. although you may not practice it yourself or you know, um, you know, know anyone in it or anything like that or have someone on your team in it in that same faith, you can definitely understand it and relate to it based on your training. Right, so and you learn, anyone, mm -hmm, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. And you learn to respect mm -hmm. other people's faith and where they are. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't prophetize at all. Mm -hmm. I'm not there for that. I'm not there to convert them to what I believe. It's accepting them where they are. And supporting them through this end of life experience. Exactly. Now, do you work more with the family of the patient or the patient themselves? Um, mainly the patient, okay. but we do involve the families as well. Mm -hmm and I offer support to them, and I tell them whatever that may look like to you. I do offer grief um, material and resources. Uh, we have ample uh, books that they um, can relate to, whatever they're going through. We have coloring books for children after a loved one has died, so we try to uh, serve the whole family. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. How has the pandemic changed um, hospice or, you know, the chaplain or the industry? Um, how has or has your role changed as a chaplain since the pandemic? Yes, especially when it first, Ruth, when mm -hmm. the pandemic first hit, um, our chaplain role changed tremendously. I can imagine. Um, the facilities we're not allowing anyone in but our RNs mm -hmm. and the families that are at home patients, they were very reluctant, understandably right. so, right. you know. 
So what I did, um, thank goodness we could do Zoom okay. with our patients and of course phone calls. Mm -hmm. And then I got real creative, uh, Ruth. I started writing personal notes ah. and cards and I would take them to the facility. I still couldn't get in the facility, but at least I could leave them at the desk, the receptionist's nice. desk Very for nice. my patient. And for my home patients, everything is done by permission. So mm -hmm. I would still have to call and ask for a visit. So I would call and say, hey, um, I'm just calling to check in and see how you're managing. Uh, just wanted to drop you a card by, I'll leave it at the door. And so I would leave it at the door, call them, let them know, and they would come to the door and I would get back in my car and I could see my patient. And I tell you, so many of them, other than the RN, our nurse, mm -hmm. we were the only contact that they oh. had with the outside world. Wow, So what a difference yeah. that had to make. Yes. That yes. was a very, very scary time for all of us, and I can only imagine for your patients, you yes. know, going through what they were going through to have that added stress and not being able to connect. Yes. So that probably did make a big difference. Kudos to you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. yes, thank yes. you, thank you. Um, what is the most rewarding or fulfilling part of your job? The patients, the patients and their themselves. families. Okay. Mm -hmm. I truly feel that I'm fulfilling my God-given purpose. Mm -hmm. And knowing that I'm doing what I have been set on this earth to do mm -hmm. is fulfilling to me to know that I can, at the end of life, hold her hand, comfort a family, mm -hmm. or just be there, not mm -hmm. saying anything, or listening to their story mm -hmm. and them reminisce or, or, or maybe just tell me the life story of their loved ones. Mm -hmm. You know, that means a lot. That means a lot. It does. Yes. So when your patients get that comfortable where they just share those things with you, it's, it's, it makes you want to show up again tomorrow and Yes. And do this all over again. Yes. Because it has to be very difficult dealing in death all day and dealing with um, the end of life um, for someone. So how do you manage that? How do, what do you do to help uh, manage yourself when it comes to just being in a sad environment all day? That's where I rely on my faith. Okay. That's where okay. my faith come in. Okay. And just really, really sitting and reflecting, it keeps you humble. It keeps mm -hmm. me humble. Okay. It mm -hmm. truly keeps me humble and grateful. And it makes me appreciate the little things, yes. you know, um, mm -hmm. just having dinner with my husband or my, uh, both of my sons live abroad it makes me want to connect. And I got three beautiful grandchildren. Grandchildren, okay, yes. And yes, and to appreciate them and not put off that call, you know, mm -hmm. and it gives you a different perspective. An totally. approach to life, it sounds like. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So how does one become a chaplain? If they hear, you know, this interview, us talking to you, and they say, you know what, I'm like that. How do, how do they go about it? Volunteer and sound like how you started? Would that be something you would recommend? Yes. Okay. Yes. Does VITAS yeah. offer volunteering? Okay. We do. Mm -hmm. We do. The pandemic kind of shut it down, but mm -hmm. we're going now to where we are accepting volunteers and it's just going through the training like I did. Mm -hmm. and, um, and another thing we have that they can assist with is we have memory bears that if uh, one of our patients, family want a memory bear, we provide that. So we have volunteers that can help with that. We have what we call the compassionate visits, which was I first started uh -huh. uh, doing, where they can sit with the family, uh, will sit with the patient while the family just go grocery shopping or just take a walk. 
Nice. So wow. that's another thing. But if you wanted to become a hospice chaplain, um, it does require a master's mm -hmm. and the CPE. Mm -hmm. But and what is CPA, CPE clinical again? Clinical Pastoral Education. <laughs> so if any of our viewers are watching and they yes. say, well, I have a ma like you did, I have a master's, but <laughs> what is that other thing? You would be able to help them with that. Right. Okay. Yes. With that CPE. Yes. So volunteering um, is, a, is a definitely a way to give back and help. If even if it's chaplains, not what you want to do. And if you want to support people that they're going through this process and being a patient. Mm -hmm. OK, well, thank you so much, Millie. Is there anything else that you can um, add about the hospice experience or being a chaplain that may um, benefit our viewers? Uh, I would like to say that mm -hmm. um, just touching a little bit on hospice. OK. And hospice is a service. Mm -hmm. And it's a service that we provide, even though we do have facilities. Mm -hmm. And as a chaplain, I go into facilities and I do go into the home. And it's not just end of life, even okay. though end of life is expected within six months. Uh, but I tell my patients and family two things. We don't have a crystal ball right. and we're not God. Yes. So... If someone is thinking about it, we do have what we call palliative care, mm -hmm. and we're there to journey along them yes. at this crucial time in their life. Right. Well, that's very important that you say that. I know I am a personal um, participant in a, in a hospice program, and you're right. Um, you know, my mother was in hospice, and she was there for um, about 13 months, and I currently care for someone under VITAS Hospice as well, and they've been living for now two years or so under mm -hmm. hospice. So um, that is something very important. I'm glad you shared with our viewer, viewers that hospice is a support system. It's a service. Um, it could be during palliative care, and it's just something that someone or a service to come alongside families and support them when a person is just very ill sometimes or terminally ill. Right. So thank you so much, Millie, for being here. Uh, thank you for our viewers for watching today's segment of Lay to Rest, um, Live Well, End Well, with our very special guest, Chaplain Mildred Ingram. So tune in next week for another inspiring and educational show as we continue to make a, a, a shift um, that living well includes ending well. Until next time, believe in tomorrow.